Hello, um, welcome to Queer Robbery webinar number two. Uh, my name is Damien Bonson. I'm the founder of Black Rainbow. Um, thank you all for joining us and those who are um, coming back for a second um, second part of our series. Um, Queer Robbery is a series of First Nation, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, asexual, uh, non-binary and sister girl and brother boy workers who are doing that work for our community. Uh, Black Rainbow have created this in partnership with the um, Mental Health Professionals Network to bring this information uh, to you all. Our first uh, webinar was on our study, Black Rainbow's study on the COVID-19 uh, and the impact on our community. Today, uh, we are speaking with um, Professor Braden Hill and Dr. Bep Ewick um, about the research project that I was also part of called Breaking the Silence out of Western Australia. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all on today. Um, I'm coming to you from Alice Springs. I'm in my car. Um, I've been an hour stuck in traffic. So apologies for the um, dodgy laptop uh, movement. Um, but without further ado, uh, we'll get underway. Thanks very much for joining us. Damien, and welcome to everyone who's joining us today and also people who are gonna be viewing this on recording. I'm Damien Ricks and I'm facilitating today's session. I am a professor in psychology at Flinders University and I'm also a psychotherapist who works in private practice with trans young people. I'd like to introduce our panel. Obviously you've just met Damien Bonson. I'd now like to introduce Brayden. Brayden, would you like to share a little bit about yourself, please? I am a Noongar Wodandi man from the southwest of Western Australia, um, and I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Students, Equity and Indigenous at Edith Cowan University, and I'm really, really grateful to be here with you all today. Thanks, Brayden. Uh, Bep, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Damien. Uh, my name is Bep Ewing. I'm a Noongar woman from Perth, WA, and Senior Research Fellow at Coolbardi Aboriginal Centre at Murdoch University and was one of the investigators on this project. Thanks, Bep. And we should have the next slide, please, I think. So this webinar, uh, as Damien outlined, is a, a unique collaboration between Black Rainbow and Mental Health Pro Professionals Network. And hopefully you did join us for the last one. We've even got even more people registered for this one, which is wonderful. Next slide, please. So that was our panel. You've just seen us all. Uh, we're a slide behind, um, but that's all of our lovely faces and that's who we'll be talking to you today. Next slide, please. So these are our learning outcomes that you've probably already had in an email. Uh, so clearly the main focus today is for Braden and Bep to talk about the findings of their project, Breaking the Silence. And really we want you to, to, to take away some really practical information about what it means to be working with people in these diverse communities. Next slide, please. So I'll hand it over to Braden now to introduce his team who are involved in conducting this research. Thanks very much, Damien. Um, you see the team in front of you. It's a majority Indigenous queer-led um, team, which I think is really important. Bep's our amazing Noongar um, queer ally. Uh, and uh, Dr Jenny Dodd is also our, um, our representative sample from the straight white community. So um, she was a wonderful um, uh, co-researcher. Uh, Damien, as mentioned, was part of the project. Uh, we have uh, colleagues who aren't with us today, uh, Shan Bennett from Edith Cowan University, but also uh, Dr Anne-Marie Eads from Curtin University. So uh, a wonderful team that I um, produced a, a great piece of work from a, from a really um, kind of uh, small piece of, of research funding. So we're, we're really grateful to be able to talk to you about it today. Uh, next slide, please. So for us, it was really important that this project, because not a lot of this had been done before, it was really important to us that we were able to design this in collaboration with community, but also with organisations that work with Indigenous queer mob. Um, and so a, a strange quirk of our ethics process was that um, the, the ethics committee that we went through uh, really encouraged us to go first to the organisations as opposed to the community, which, which is an interesting flip on, on the way we probably would, approached it, would have approached it ourselves. But um, it was a useful piece in that we were able to talk to elders, um, to, to um, members of the LGBTQA plus community, um, people working in organisations to help shape what the research project should be doing and what it should be focusing on. 
And one of the things that came out of that really clearly was that um, they wanted this to be a WA-centric piece of research. They weren't interested in, in looking more broadly, largely because there was a sense that um, we needed to start small and focus on the, the particular nuances of, of WA. So we really honoured that. Um, in order to make sure that we were uh, making sure that the research was useful to the people who would who would operationalise really some of the findings, we partnered with a number of organisations, um, Aboriginal Health Services in Western Australia, as well as University Student Support Services to really think about what are the questions we should be asking um, and how we can make sure that the project is going to be useful to the communities that we're seeking to serve. So you can see some of them there, Wanjining Aboriginal Corporation, we worked with Yorghum Aboriginal Service, SHQ, Mordich Court, who are in the south um, southern corridor of Western Australia. So they were our partners at the beginning of the research and they were partners all the way through. So next slide, please. So in terms of how we did the research, um, we, we really started uh, with a, uh, a survey of uh, WA health and education service providers, primarily um, health service providers. Um, so we had 206 responses from individual health professionals across the state. Um, we'll break that down a little bit later on for you. Uh, we then followed up with five focus groups involving 49 participants where we really sought to interrogate some of the stuff that we found in the surveys to really deepen our understanding of what we were seeing there. And then we conducted five unstructured interviews with individuals who um, felt like they wanted to share their viewpoint in a space where it wasn't in relation to their colleagues. And that was interesting in and of itself, but I think that's worthwhile calling out. Um, that was the first phase of the research. The second phase was then looking at community and we conducted an online survey um, that went out to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community here, uh, LGBTQ plus community living in Western Australia. Um, and you can see the responses there. Uh, thanks, next slide. So I'm going to talk you through the first phase of the research, which was with uh, the research with staff in organisations that are working to service um, the, the, the queer Indigenous community in Western Australia. Uh, next slide. In terms of those who responded to the survey that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, many of the people who were responding were mental, mental health professionals. So you can see counsellors, psychologists, Clint Sykes came out um, as being quite a predominant um, uh, group in terms of their responses to the survey, followed by nurses, educators and trainers, etc. So this gives you a, a decent idea of those who were responding. I think interestingly, you'll see in our, in, you won't see it in our slides, but in our report, many of the people who were in the space were Aboriginal themselves and or um, part of the queer community. So it's a really, really strong um, evidence base, I think, from the insights that we received. So thanks. Next, next slide. So really in short, so in the conversations that we, we had with the organisations, these were some of the key findings that I think are really worth highlighting. Um, so uh, one of the clear things that came out was that employing and retaining Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer staff was really important to those working in the organisations. One of the things that I found quite interesting is that visible signs and sim symbols were seen as being really important. Whilst we might think of these things as being quite trivial, they, they really did mean a lot for the people who were working in these services who observed client behaviour and, and willingness to engage in the services. Um, of course, mandatory professional development was always there. We, there was also a lot of conversation around safe referral and understood referral pathways for trans and gender diverse people. But that's a particularly broader problem in Western Australia. And I think an interesting um, finding was the sense that we really needed to have inclusive organisational conversations with boards and executives about how we do this work well. They can be extreme enablers, but they can also be considerable um, obstacles. So that was a really key finding that, that came out from that. Next slide, please. So when we kind of said to organisations in Western Australia working with Aboriginal queer community, we said, well, what are the sorts of um, resources or what, what sorts of things do you need to work, um, work well with this community? And a lot of people pointed to just needing more information, updated resource, and, of course, remembering that there's not a huge evidence base around Indigenous queer um, lived experience, even in relation to health. Uh, th th there's this thirst or need um, to have more information. One of the things that came out as well is making sure that we have inclusive data collection in our organisation. So some staff were saying things like, I can't 
go to my CEO uh, and tell them why this is important because I just don't have the data to back up the arguments. And this came out really clearly in terms of client intake forms, et cetera. Then it was really important that we had policies that backed up some of the work that we're doing around inclusion more broadly than just the bullying and harassment stuff. There was a really um, concerted um, suggestion that we have inclusion around, around queer inclusion, if you like. And of course, greater re representation and visibility uh, within, within community was always helpful. Um, so they were some of the key things the organisations were telling us. I'll just move to the next slide now for the next phase of the research. So the first phase, as I, as I mentioned, focused on organisations. We then went to community to find out what they thought. And so the primary uh, um, way in which we did that was through an online survey, primarily using social media. So I'll just talk through uh, some of our, uh, our findings there. So next slide, please. So in terms of who responded uh, to our survey, you can see uh, some of the demographics there. I think interestingly, less than 2% identified as trans um, or brother, boy, sister, girl. And But when you'll see that 19% indicated that the gender was different to that assigned um, at birth, it does it does throw up an interesting um, an interesting um, point that we probably probably need to need to think through, um, and I think Bep uh, has some has some um, insights on that one. And it's probably worth pointing out as well that the majority of the respondents lived in the metro area and were under the age of thirty. So that's one of the limitations of the study. But Bep, I don't know if you wanted to just talk about that one quickly. Yeah, I think our finding that people didn't necessarily tick the box to say they were trans, brother, boy, or sister, girl, um, is interesting in terms of the language you, we use going forward. In our national survey of youth, we also found brother, brother, boy, sister, girl was not a commonly used term at all. I think it's very community specific. Um, so I think a really solid way of asking around trans status is asking people if they were, uh, if they are a gender that was different to that assigned at birth. Thanks very much, Bip. Uh, next slide. Me anyway. So in terms of where people were going for uh, emotional support, when we asked people within their family networks if, who they were going to for support, um, the majority said they were going to their mothers or their siblings. And then when we asked around people outside of family, there was a fairly even um, amount that went to LGBT friends or non-LGBT friends. In terms of formal support, which I assume most of the audience is, is interested in working in the mental health space, it was really clear that people were going to psychologists, GPs and clinical psychologists for support. So 60% of the sample said they um, would go to one of those health practitioners. Um, only 50%, only half of the sample said that they would go to someone who was Aboriginal and LGBT. So it's important to note that that having someone with that same lived experience is not necessarily what people are looking for. We also had 50% um, of the samples saying that they went to the emergency department. So it's really interesting to think about whether our emergency department staff are adequately trained to meet the needs of LGBT mob. Um, and we also had relatively high use of online services, although satisfaction with those services varied across the type of service. Beth, it'd be lovely to hear a little bit more about what online services people were accessing. Sure, yeah. The majority of uh, people who did go to a service went to Beyond Blue, so that seemed to be the website that people were going to to access mental health support. Um, other than that, we found fairly low use of other uh, lifeline-type services or online information. Next slide, please. So we asked a lot about people's daily experiences going about through life, and there's some interesting take-homes from this one. 73% of people were um, had experienced discrimination daily based on their sexuality, which was really concerning. 12% had been a victim of assault. 12% um, had experienced housing insecurity. And in our qualitative open-ended questions, half of the sample or over half of the sample mentioned racism as some form of discrimination. This really points to the experiences of racism and harassment that LGBT mob are facing. I'll just point out with the 12% as victims of assault there, we asked that around general going about life, whether you were assaulted. But when we asked about interpersonal violence, 65% of the sample had experienced interpersonal violence from a partner or a family member. And it was most likely they had experienced that violence from multiple people in their community. Next slide, please. 
Of course, we were interested in people's well-being. We used the growth empowerment measure in a piece subscale to assess people's well-being. Um, overall, there were moderate levels of well-being in the sample, um, so not too high, not too low. In terms of what was predicting that well-being, comfort in being asked about your LGBT identity by a service provider predicted higher well-being. So the more comfortable people felt talking about that with the service provider, the more uh, the higher their, their well-being was. But understandably, experiences of heterosexism and transphobia by Aboriginal community members was significantly linked to lower well-being. Next slide, please. Thanks, Bet. Um, in terms of some of the other interrogation we did with the community was looking at their sense of connection to the queer community within Western Australia. Um, concerningly, you know, less than half stated that they felt a sense of belonging in the broader, in the broader queer community here in Western Australia. Um, and kind of backing up what Bep said, 40% had experienced some form of microaggression from non-Indigenous queers within the last 12 months. Um, that need to, to educate is something that people certainly felt burdened with within that community. Uh, and, of course, we see that more than half had the experience of being the token Aboriginal person in an organisation, particularly in, in queer spaces. So um, some interesting things for us to think about in terms of the ways in which we build allyship within the queer communities around matters such as racism. Next slide. Sorry, Brandon, Damien, you, yep. Brandon and Bep, it'd be lovely to hear. I know we spoke previously about those microaggressions. Yeah. Uh, Bep mentioned about sexual racism. It'd be wonderful to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. We had two questions, particularly around sexual racism. So 18% of the sample said they'd been treated as seen as exotic uh, because of their Aboriginality by a potential dating partner, whereas 21% said that they had been rejected because of their Aboriginality. But it is interesting to note when we asked particularly about online dating apps, 41% said they didn't disclose their Aboriginality. So it may be that people are underreporting um, discrimination that they're at risk of because they're actually just not telling potential partners that they're Aboriginal. Thanks, Beth. That's yeah, really important. I think something for us to keep unpacking that, you know, the the gap between disclosure, we know, you know, certainly from the literature on black trans people, for example, that you know, when people disclose, it can result in things like positive interactions, but can also lead people open to greater you know, amounts of discrimination. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Pep. Thanks, Damien. Um, so when we asked respondents as well about their connections within their within the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community within WA, um, the unfortunate thing is a majority feared some form of discrimination from uh, because of their sexuality or gender identity from within the Aboriginal community. So there's a perception um, that they weren't going to be accepted. And, and worryingly, a third felt that they, because of who they are, they were entirely invisible within their community, which is something that um, that we do worry about. And this kind of corresponds to some of the stuff that you can see on the slide. But one of the things that wasn't a surprise, but is one that we really wanted to, I'll talk through later on, was that feeling of acceptance from elders and community leaders. Um, there were quite a few people who did not feel as though they were accepted. It certainly wasn't overwhelmingly high, but it, it was something in a lot of the discourse with organisations that came out clearly, this presumption that um, elders were oppositional to queer inclusive kind of thinking. So um, I, I think that's uh, some of the interesting findings to interrogate here as well. Right, uh, and you said when... Yep. Can I just ask a question? When you sure. said earlier that the Ethics Committee sort of suggested starting with elders and organisations, and you spoke to elders, yeah? Yep. What did elders say about their acceptance of queer mob? So it was interesting. When we first started, it was um, a small group of elders that were part of our university community, if you like, where, that we really kind of leaned on. It wasn't until uh, the back end of the research when we were presenting back the findings that we really got a significant dialogue with them about uh, queer inclusion really in the community. And, and I talk about that um, later on in the slide. So you'll see some of the some of the, the commentary that comes out of there. But it was really interesting just on that. We, we called this breaking the silence because a lot of communities felt like it was a silence that wasn't being spoken about. But I think because of the great work of, of organisations like Black Rainbow, over the years of doing this research, we, we, I think we started to observe an openness and changing in the dialogue that we saw at the, was the, end, of the, at the end of the project. So I'll, I'll talk through some of that, but it's a good question, Damien. Thanks. Um, next slide, please. 
So, uh, of course, we, we wanted to make sure that we captured from the community participants uh, what were the best things about being Indigenous and queer. And I think um, for, for I resonated a lot with this as somebody who comes from the community, but I think uh, the idea that you have ability to change hearts and minds in family and community and broader society was something that came out really strongly. A lot of, um, a lot of the participants pointed to uh, in the qualitative comments, feeling like they can mentor people through their journey, um, having learned from what they've gone through and navigating that um, within various cultural contexts. Um, and a lot of people talked about the ability of being able to trans transverse and transgress, I guess, across different communities and, and why that was important to them as well. Um, next slide. Um, so as Damien uh, uh, mentioned, we, we did uh, do a piece of work around yarning with the elders group. So you can see a number of our elders there. Most of them are Noongar, but not all, uh, with some of the research team there. I guess the key messages that came out of that was that education was important, community-based education was important, dialogue with family and communities about it was uh, exceptionally uh, exceptionally vital. You can see some of the commentary there that's come directly from the elders um, themselves. And I must admit, this is probably the first time that I can recall ever having a conversation with um, a bunch of people, most of whom are my elders, um, about queerness. And I must admit, it was um, probably the most rewarding and inspiring part of the research project because I, I too, like our participants, had a sense that there would be a reluctance or um, a hesitation to embrace inclusion. But as you can see in some of the commentary there, um, it was really well embraced. And, and you can see my grandmother on the far right there, who was also very much part of the, the story too. So you can see that the presumption of elders being oppositional is something we probably need to think through. And it's probably very community specific. Um, next slide. Okay, thanks, Braden. So we wanted to provide the audience some insight on how you can integrate these findings into your daily practice. And I think uh, there's a few take-home messages. So it's important to understand people's intersecting identities and how this can present in health outcomes in ways that are challenging but also empowering, as we saw from comments on what is, being, what is great about being Aboriginal and queer. The finding that people are likely to go to their GP or psychologist means that you are probably seeing Aboriginal LGBT people as your clients, um, even if you're not aware of that. So we need to practice as if they are present. We yeah, do need to, I think we would all love to hear more about that idea of practice as if they are present. What, are, what sort of does that look like for you? Yeah, so I think every day in our sessions and our, and our work with people, it's not assuming people are hetero, not assuming people are white um, and not putting questions forward, for example, your husband, your wife, not assuming that, not assuming people's culture. Um, and, and going to the next point here around discrimination, something I'm particularly passionate about is as therapists and GPs, being comfortable with talking about discrimination and racism and being comfortable to be interrogated around how you are going to work with that in session by someone um, and also not assuming that someone, if they may not look visibly Aboriginal, quote, unquote, that they're not experiencing the impacts of discrimination and likewise for the queer community. If, they, if someone doesn't read as queer to you, it's not for you to assume they're not experiencing um, negative uh, discrimination. Um, I think so it is important to understand the realities of people's lived experience and discrimination that is structural and interpersonal. Um, and I think it's important, as Braden was saying around the elders, in general, we can't make assumptions that there is going to be community resistance or support for Aboriginal LGBT people in, in either of the communities. We have to really figure out what's going on, going on in the communities that we work with. Um, and helping people find supportive networks within their communities is a huge part of our job as practitioners, I believe. And sometimes it might be upon you um, to go out into communities and figure out who the support people are um, that you can link your patients in with. Next slide, please. So it's lovely, actually, because I do quite a lot of these with MHPN and often we don't run as well to time, but we've actually been very timely today. Thank you to Braden and Beth for really talking us through so clearly the findings and breaking the silence. And of course, that means that we've got actually more time than we had planned for for our Q&A. Uh, so if you haven't already posted a question, 
Uh, please click on the three dots down the bottom uh, right-hand side of your screen and, and pose a question that you'd like us to answer. Uh, and Damien's available here. Damien Bolson is also available here to engage as well as Braden and Bep. But we've got some questions. Obviously, you were all able to uh, share questions ahead of the event. And so we've got some questions here already for Bep and Braden to respond to. So we might start with those as the live questions start rolling in. So I've got one for Braden, which is how do we address the lack of safe and inclusive services for First Nations queer mob who live in remote communities? Yeah, look, I think it's a, a really great question. I think the, the, the broader, more fundamental question is how do we address really poor health service provision in rural remote areas generally? Um, I think one of the things that we need to really understand is um, you know, we need to understand if this is a, a, a genuine issue. I think what we found in our research is that um, inclusion varied quite significantly, even within metro areas around organisation provision. So I think it's important to understand um, the nature of the, the problem. I think where you see in any organisation, wherever geographically it might be, if it exists, um, leadership, governance and the culture of the organisation are really critical around queer inclusion and making sure that they are safe spaces for people to operate in. Um, I think that's, I think to assume geography then means lack of safety is probably something we'd, we'd have to interrogate a little bit further. But where we see the signs of success around inclusion, it kind of really holds for any organisation where there's a visible presence um, around queerness and, and there's an embracing of Aboriginal queerness that's that's proactive, where we have policies and intake um, kind of you know data that helps inform practice. Those sorts of things that exist in any organisation would hold for any region, I believe. Um, but we probably need to do a little bit more work to interrogate this. But one organisation can be fantastic at one moment, and then you have a change of staff, and then it's not. So I think it's about how do you put those sustaining structures in place to make sure it's a matter of fact, business as usual, expectation of health service provision. Thanks, Braden. That's a great answer. Uh, Kelly has asked in the live question, are we going to get a copy of the slides? Yes, Kelly, they are actually available to you right now. If you click the three dots down the bottom right hand side of your screen, the slides will be there now. Uh, I've got another question for Bep this time. What's one thing that queer or queer events and community can do to contribute? Um, I have friends who throw queer events and they're usually so white as an, and as a person of colour myself, it doesn't always feel inclusive or like it's our space. Sure. Yeah, that's definitely something um, we hear from, from community as well. Look, I think there's there's genuine inclusion that can happen. So thinking about if you are throwing a Pride event, for example, it's our Pride Month here in WA, so this is a, a kind of topical issue for us, thinking about what role can Aboriginal people play. So if you're having panels, are you including people of colour or Aboriginal people? Are you getting them to come and speak? Are you having welcomes um, to country? Are you acknowledging the country that you're on? Um, there is so much rich Aboriginal queer history, particularly in the activism space, that can be celebrated. Um, and so it's, it's reaching out to communities and forming those networks and relationships to actually hear about how they want to be included in events. Um, and we can all, all start doing that, I think. So, Beppa, I might keep you on the line. Can I throw a live question to you? Sure. What do you feel the prerequisites are for an organisation to genuinely use symbols such as pride flags to show a safe and inclusive organisation? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if it's a prerequisite because I actually think symbols is one of the first things I recommend um, services do. So get your flags and start putting them out there. But I think there needs to be some level of queer inclusion and Aboriginal cultural safety training to go with. So I was having a staff discussion around we're going to put these symbols out because we want people to feel welcome when they walk in the door or, or visit our service online. And so what does that actually mean for us as a service? Does that mean that we all are going to be on board with using pronouns? Does that mean that we are not going to bring any negative assumptions to our work? Does it mean that we need to go and find some additional training or speak to people in the community that can inform us on this um, population? So I think it can be a really good first step, um, but it has to be backed up with that commitment to further learning. Thanks, Beb. Uh, Braden. I've got a couple of live questions that have come in that I think I'll throw to you that sort of go together. So Shannon has asked, why do you think only 50% of respondents wanted to see a practitioner with a similar identity to them? 
And Steph has asked, um, wasn't sure if they'd missed it or not, but how big was the community sample size for the survey? Thanks, Damien. On the first one, I think um, that surprised me, if I'm honest. I mean, for me, I would jump at the chance to see a mental health professional who uh, is Indigenous and queer. But I think when you think about Aboriginal identity, the journey that people go on in terms of understanding their own sense of self and cultural self, it, it, it might be quite challenging if we presume that all Indigenous um, clients want to see an Indigenous um, support worker, if you like, or, or psychologist or whatever it may be. So um, I think it's, it, it's probably similar to, to the broader population. Um, there's also, I think, as Beth talked about before, there, there, there are kind of differing expectations dependent on individual circumstances around what they want to get out of therapy or what they want to get out of their, their health service kind of um, needs. Uh, and I think it, it is highly individual, but still 50% isn't insignificant. I, I think that's still something to, to, to pay attention to and, and, and think about for sure. Um, on the sample size question, um, Bep, I might ask you if you don't mind, because I know you, you did some thinking about this one. I'll, I'll throw to you if that's okay. Yeah, 63 responses from the um, community survey. Thanks, Beb. And okay. I'll throw, again, two questions out to both of you and you might choose who wants to answer because they're, they're sort of paired questions. So Cathy's asked uh, a lot of the research participants were in metro areas. What did you sort of do to reach out to remote communities? And Patricia has asked, do you think there is, because of that sort of large metro component, is there a differences between remote and re regional experiences? So I might jump in quickly if that's all right. Look, I think um, we, we were severely limited by the um, the small nature of the project. I think is one thing. Usually, these sorts of projects you, you'd be given um, funding to be able to travel and really make sure that you're able to build those relationships. But this was very much a kind of first of its kind seed funding. So we're, we're talking less than sixty. $60,000 to kind of make this happen, um, which sounds like a lot, but it doesn't go very far. It's why we opted for the online kind of way of working to try and capture as many views as, as we could. Um, so I think in terms of the nuance around regional and metro, th there was some, um, but I think it's an area that we most certainly need to um, explore further. Bep, I don't know if you wanted to add, given um, some of the work you're doing with Walk and Cutagen. Yeah, look, to be, to be fair, um when we do go a little bit, well, we have a lot more scope in our national work. We're not seeing too many regional differences. And I think that might be how region is coded in, in national surveys. Honestly, talking with people across Australia, it's so community specific. Um, and so if your particular community, whether that be the, the Noongar community in urban Perth or a particular community in a remote location, it is, that's, it's very insular in terms of what is talked about and what is accepted and what is celebrated. Um, and I don't think the, you know, ABS codes, for example, around regionality and rurality and remoteness capture that necessarily. Um, but I, I will flag also, you know, we know that the majority of Aboriginal people in Australia do live in urban settings. So it is really important to have findings um, for people living in the metro area. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Braden. I just want to signal to everyone, uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so left for questions. We're having a lot of questions coming on the live, which is fantastic. And uh, we, we have only gone through two of the ones that we were given ahead of time. So I just want to signal we're not going to be able to answer everyone's question, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, so we have a question from Alastair, who's a Wiradjuri brother boy. And a similar question came through ahead of time, which I think Bep was going to speak to. Uh, as researchers working with community, do you have advice for keeping ourselves and each other and the community you work with safe and affirmed? Yeah, it's, it's a really fantastic question. So... Um, I'm not. I'm not. My part, uh, I'm not a queer person, but I can speak from keeping safe as an Aboriginal person. Um, honestly, this project is the first project I've worked on where um, Aboriginal queer people are the majority investigators, and I can I can tell you it just makes it lovely. It makes it so easy to bring back and debrief issues with the team and talk about is this what we're comfortable with um is this what we're are we are we reading things correctly this kind of thing so i actually think having aboriginal and if it's a queer topic aboriginal queer leadership in projects and majority leadership in projects is the way to go um and and brayden touched on relationships earlier um and so having having opportunities to talk to communities and and making sure you're going out and talking with partners 
routinely and just checking in with them is a really nice way to check how the project's going, how you're going, if everyone's feeling safe and comfortable and, and just taking from them, taking advice from them. Thanks, Bep. So, uh, Jones asked uh, in the acronym that we've been using throughout and is in queer robbery, what does SB stand at the end? It stands for Sister Girls and Brother Boys, which is uh, um, Bep spoke about earlier as being sort of maybe applicable to some communities, but actually didn't have really wide uptake within this particular survey. And then in the chat, uh, Kai has asked a question, were there any particular themes you noticed among trans and gender diverse respondents, whether in terms of support or discrimination? Yep, so I think broadly it kind of follows trends in, in research that we see elsewhere where transgender diverse communities within communities certainly feel that sense of discrimination, that sense of isolation. They experience that um, on a much more frequent basis and that wasn't dissimilar to the sample uh, that we saw here. Again, not a huge sample, um, but I think when you looked at the organisational findings, as we said, there's a really clear view in Western Australia that a lot of mental health professionals do not know where they should be referring transgender diverse clients. And I think that's that's kind of backed up by what we've seen in, in our study. Um, Beth, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, just echoing that in, in the larger research we're doing as well. Not always, but if, if there are differences in services experiences, it's usually along um, between trans and cisgendered people, with trans people generally having worse experiences, feeling worse, feeling less included in either community. Um, and look, there's a huge piece of work um, to do with elders and our services around um, talking around gender uh, and gender diversity because, um, uh, you know, talking with elders is they're generally okay and pretty conversant talking around sexuality. And so our next kind of piece of work and advocacy, I think, is around that gender diversity piece as well. Yeah, and that, that's most certainly what the elders were calling out for in terms of education. They wanted to 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 know more, to be able to talk about it um, in a in a more uh, proactive and sensitive way. So that was a self reflected kind of need from the from our elders group as well. Thanks, Braden and Beth. We've had a couple of questions come in around language, which I think are quite interesting. So both Zane and Sissy have asked questions about is it okay to use words such as queer and mob in a clinical setting? And also from the research, uh, what kind of words or language do people seem to be using to describe their sexuality and their gender? If, as you mentioned before, Bep, sister girls and brother boys wasn't particularly a common term that people identified with. Yeah, so I think um, being able to... to the relationships are really important in understanding the ways in which people want to be identified. I think sometimes I hear white fellows throw out mob this, mob that, and it feels a little bit inauthentic, like it kind of feels like they're trying. But I think the, the, I think the intention is right, that there needs to be relationships with communities you're working with to understand what is terminology, but also acknowledge that there's great diversity in terms of what people think. I think some of the some of our older um, Indigenous LGBTQ plus um, community members don't like the term queer, and so we 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 tend to sub out the term queer when we're talking to um, um, older parts of our, our um, community. Uh, whereas the younger younger mob are perfectly fine with that. I, I think if you're comfortable using it, and you know the people that you work with are comfortable with you using it, I think that's okay. But you kind of need to take the cues, otherwise it can come across um, it can come across a little bit insincere. I think, um, Beth, I don't know what you what what you might like to add there. Yeah, I just agree with agree with that. Um, and in terms of how people are describing their sexuality, when we leave it open, I mean, um, you'll see in the report that we've provided, um, we we just put a table of all the ways that people describe their sexuality and gender and it's it's diverse but people are using things like pansexual bisexual demi girl demi boy so terms that are in the lgbt community quite popular at the moment um and i think that's probably because we have a bit of a younger sample this this sample was under 30 as well um so yeah terms that you would probably hear in non-aboriginal lgbt people Thanks, Bep. So going back to questions that we got ahead of time, one for Braden was, are there cultural barriers to individuals identifying as part of the LGBTIQA plus community? And if so, how can practitioners navigate this to ensure all supports can be met? Yeah, it's an interesting question and one I think we, we get a lot. I think that there's that kind of presumed um, opposition to queer inclusion in Aboriginal communities that we sometimes have ourselves that 
hasn't really been borne out in some of the, the, the stuff that we found in this study. So it's probably important to um, interrogate that um, a little bit. Where we do see clear, clear um, uh, barriers to for Indigenous um, queer people, particularly, is where you see uh, the entwining of religio culture into understandings of Indigenous culture, and that most certainly comes through quite clearly where uh, where Indigenous queer mob don't feel embraced by the Aboriginal community that they're part of. Very, very often, I think, in, in some of the, the comments that we saw as part of the research, there was a religious underpinning to that. And I think, you know, we have to reflect on the kind of settler, colonial, heteronormative narratives around gender um, and, and sexuality and interrogate that a little bit more. But I think the idea that um, that it's uh, that Indigenous cultures are inherently kind of exclusionary is one that we, we need to think about. So I guess in terms of practitioners thinking about how they navigate that, um, holding that understanding in the back of their mind is is really critical. Um, and I think it is difficult, but if you have, I mean, as I've had, you know, some elders in my community are really staunch Christians, for example, who who will really come at that line of thinking when it comes to queerness. And it's very difficult for Noongar mob to go, hang on, uncle, I don't, I don't know if I don't know if that's cor correct. It's a really tricky space for wadulas, for non-Indigenous people to get into. But I think when you're working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, it's something you can gently tease out and, and kind of work with people on. So it's it's a complex space. But I think holding that in the back of one's mind when working with clients is really critical. Thanks, Braden. And a question that came in ahead of time that I'll direct to Bep is how safe are ACOs for LGBTIQA plus uh, people? And how can I, as a specialist service provider, support other organisations, particularly ACOs, to become more inclusive? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and again, it varies across Australia and it varies by location. Um, and so we have worked with ARCOs that are incredibly supportive um, and have pride flags out the front, celebrate Pride Week, um, you know, Queensland, um, Brisbane uh, Aboriginal Health Service has um, de young, deadly free, I think it is, or have, have actual T-shirts for deadly mob um, and other services that are supporting more subtly. Um, so there's a particular person in the organisation that is pushing for inclusion and is challenging some of the leadership. And then we have services whose boards are really not on board um, with inclusion. And so it very much differs. But what we do find is the art shows that we talk to probably by virtue of people wanting to be involved in our research is that there's a hunger for information on how to be more inclusive. Often that in, in art shows that's come from the sexual health team. So it is a, it's a, a good angle to come in from, I suppose. It's sexual health teams wanting to um, know more about LGBT inclusion because that's something that they talk about naturally in their work um, and then trying to filter that through the rest of the organisation is, is the challenge ahead. Thanks, Beb. I'll put this out to both of you and you can think about who might want to answer. Camilla's asked, how can we support those trans and gender diverse people who might be incarcerated? It's a great question. Um, I think not coming from that community um, and not that not being my lived experience, it, it's also not something we interrogate as part of this research. Um, in Western Australia, we're really lucky. We have some very um, active and really thoughtful and considered um, transgender diverse advocacy groups um, who are really fantastic in helping us, I think, in my everyday job, not just in research, really think through how we um, work proactively with communities. So so my, my answer here really is, um, again, probably community specific, but there'll be people who understand this better than we do, better than you do potentially, and partnering with them around making sure that firstly, um, this is something that they can contribute to or they can at least refer to somebody who knows. I think it's the better pathway to go. Uh, research didn't interrogate it, but it's certainly something that, that should be looked into. But partnering with transgender diverse advocacy groups who are probably already doing the work is a really good place to start and helping them resource that work too. I don't know, Beth, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. I was like waiting for you to say more. Now I've got to get up my next question. Sorry. Um, that's all right. Um, there was a really, or well, they're all really interesting questions, but one I thought saw that I thought you might like 
um, from Leah, which is, do you think the low likelihood of wanting to see a professional who identifies as part of the community is because the community is so small and it might be about privacy and professional boundaries? So it could be that. Um, one of the things that we did ask, I don't know if it was in this slide deck, but we, we do ask, we did ask the community um, participants whether or not they had trust in their health information being held confidentially by Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations. And there was a great deal of trust in community participants in make, in their, um, their information being held confidentially and safe. So from that, that point of view, uh, that really did, I think, change. My, like, I think there's this kind of community narrative in WA anyway that, oh, don't go to that Aboriginal medical service because, you know, sister, sister girl there on the bench, she'll be telling your auntie, et cetera. We didn't really see that in the data. There was a great level of trust and confidence in the uh, service providers, the Aboriginal service providers. Um, Bep, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, just, I mean, in general, in terms of um, a community member and a psychologist, uh, it's 50-50 it's when people come to me to ask for a referral, to a recommendation for a psychologist, whether they want someone who's Aboriginal or not. Oftentimes that is they don't want to see someone who's Aboriginal because they want to talk about family business and they just want to make sure that that is confidential and that I guess the clinician is not conflicted. Um, but equally so, people want to talk to someone where they don't have to explain their lived experience. Um, it's, it's a broader conversation around practitioner fit and I think as practitioners we should all feel want to feel comfortable talking about our lived experience and our positionality and whether that's going to match the client that we're um, seeing. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I found when I was um, engaging with a psychologist, the very useful thing they asked is what kind of psychologist do you want to be seeing? And I was able to say, I want someone who understands what it's like to be, I don't know, in a minority community or experiences discrimination because that was important to the reason why I was going. And I think that kind of practice as an Aboriginal person was that that facility was really important to me in terms of seeking um, kind of um, uh, mental health support. Thanks, Braden. We've, we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Sorry to everyone, we're not going to get to all your questions. But one that's really standing out to me that a few people have asked is in when talking about the findings, the word interrogating was used or being interrogated. And then Braden used that word again just before. And a few people have asked what, you know, why this word and how this word fits maybe with particular marginalised communities, what this means in terms of experience and also service delivery. How does that word sort of um, have resonance for you both? Oh, look, that's probably a subjective problem that I have. I think um, coming from my lived experience around um, working, seeking health support, I think the interrogation really comes from the fact that I found that there was always a reluctance to talk about this. And when I say interrogate community, it's probably the wrong use of the word. But I really wanted to, to really get in and under some of our organisations that are so important to the work that we do in communities to really make sure that when I'm referring, you know, you know, my queer Aboriginal friends to, to go to a service that I can trust that. And I think um, the interrogation really comes from, you know, the, the considerable mental health challenges you see Indigenous queer people having, the considerable rates of suicide that we see in our communities. So it for me, there was a sense of urgency. And I think that's probably where the word comes from, the interrogation piece. Um, and it's also my own biases here. So I don't know if it's the best best um, term, but it, it does give you a sense of, of where I'm coming from when I use that term. Community is a different story, though. Uh, a cup just to maybe sort of wrap things up a little bit with questions. I don't know if Damien Bonson wants to jump back in again, but there's been a general question that came in in the chat. Uh, which is, will there be a framework or training that's created from this research to help organisations? And there was another one I remember from the chat that was also, is there training available for working with uh, queer mob? And so I'm just wondering, obviously, Damien runs that, so he's oh, he's jumped back in again. He might like to comment, but also if Braden and Beth are going to be developing any further work from this. So, Beth, perhaps it might be um, good for you to talk through the the work that you're the other piece of work that you're doing around organisational development, and then maybe Damien can talk through what what he's doing. Sure, um, we are undertaking um, a, a large piece of work consulting with Arcos um, across across Australia around what competencies people need to work with this 
with Aboriginal LGBT people. Um, it's a, it's a, a work in progress, so there's no training developed at the moment where it's a, it's a large consultative piece. So I don't have anything available at the moment, um, but I know that there is um, Damien and Black Rainbow are doing uh, are holding this space very well at the moment for people looking for training. One of the things, just before Damien jumps in, one of the things that's been quite useful about what I've been heartened by is hearing um, com- a range of community organisations, health organisations taking these uh, these findings and talking about them as part of their routine training and making sure that it is intersectional. So having the evidence base has really, I think, slowly, I, I hope, driven a change in the way people talk about um, queer inclusion generally, um, particularly in Western Australia. Um, but as you say, it's kind of, we have the evidence base now, so the training's going to catch up. But I know Damien's very much ahead of the game um, on this one. So Damien, um, your thoughts? Yeah, hi. Um, I am de- run a training called Safer Spaces. I've just actually just driven down from Darwin to Alice Springs to deliver here, uh, then into Tennant Creek, into Catherine going back. Um, I developed it about in 2017, 2016, um, independent from any funding or any um, uh, resource um, based on a need that I discovered or uncovered when working in the Kimberley region in suicide prevention, where access to services wasn't a a clear pathway for First Nations um, LGBTQTI folk. Um, I've currently um, been refunded as a part of the suicide prevention trials that were happening um, around the country. I was funded under the Darwin trial and it was viewed as a success. So I've been refunded to, or contracted actually by the Northern Territory Primary Health Network to roll it out throughout the Northern Territory. Uh, It's currently getting evaluated uh, to look at further interstate opportunities. Um, What's really fantastic about this particular bit of work that um, we've done over in WA, but also what BEP's leading is that it's going to strengthen and, and really wrap the academic rigor and evidence base around what organizations do need. Um, the workshop that I created was born out of lived experiences of First Nations uh, queer person, but also from my experience working in suicide prevention. And plus I have a, a post a grade qualification in suicide prevention as well. So these layered things um, strengthen what I do. I'm really excited for what's coming out of BEPS research so we can strengthen this stuff. And I think there's opportunities for other organisations to even develop their own and localise it. Thanks, Damien. Uh, So, yes, we would always direct you to check out Black Rainbow's work. Um, Obviously, you know, Black Rainbow is behind the development of Queer Arbery, but also just the amazing work that Damien's done. And obviously, you know, you can also go to the website and donate, which is always much appreciated. Uh, Bep and Brayden, I'd like to invite you each to just give us a little something, a little closing thought for a minute or two um, about the project or about what you think this project means. Someone certainly asked, are you going to be doing more of this nationally, which I think you hinted at earlier, but you might like to touch on that each briefly. Sure, I'll go first. Um, I'll let Bep um, cover off on the national piece. Uh, look, I think in terms of some of the, the key takeaways, I guess, that might might be helpful for, for the audience, um, there is a growing uh, evidence base and a growing um, emergence of, of Black queer scholarship um, around these matters. And I think it's really important that that we're engaging with that where we can and, and we're respecting that knowledge and, and, and um, really thinking about the implications for practice as we've done today, it's there, it's there to be um, absorbed and there to be, um, um, you know, worked with. I think in terms of practice relationships, as I said, are, are really critical in terms of the communities that you're working within, those relationships with those um, key members in community in the Indigenous queer community uh, who you can be working with and partnering with. Uh, they're really vital and it takes time, um, but it's it's well worth, well worth the, the, the effort in terms of what, we try to do in this space. Um, I also think partnering with organisations that are already doing the work and and resourcing that work and working out ways in which you can kind of be on the same trajectory. I think one of the struggles we have is that you have um, really great organisations that might be small doing amazing work that are at risk of being defunded and you have big organisations that kind of wake up to needing to be inclusive in the queer space and it kind of steamrolls those 
um, smaller organizations or community-based organizations that are doing really wonderful work. So thinking about how you can build relationships and partner with those sorts of organizations and those with the lived experience is really vital. But as I said, relationships with people in your community, consulting um, the black literature around health broadly is really important. And also where you're starting to see some stuff in the black queer space, it's really important to engage with that work as well. What about you, Beth? Yeah, um, absolutely. I I have a few take homes from this project myself personally, and then and then for the audience. So, being brought into this project um, by Braden and then and meeting Damien and hearing about the work Black Rainbow does and he does was an eye opener for me as an Indigenous woman. So, I didn't in my daily life think about queer members of my community. So, I I think it's really great that everyone has showed up today and and tried to gain some awareness of working with this community um, for people who weren't aware. Um, I do think working with organisations who are on the ground is the best way to do it because, as Braden um, noted, at that's where the, the, the practice is happening. It may be in small pockets and it, it may just be within small parts of the community, but the good practice is happening there. So I do encourage people to contact their um, Aboriginal health councils if they have one in their state or territory um, contact their local, local art shows, find out what is happening in this space, if at all, and start having conversations around practising in this space. Um, and then likewise, one-on-one -on -one with the people that you um, are providing support for. Don't be afraid to talk about this intersectionality um, and how that might impact someone's life. Uh, from, sorry, from a national, sorry, from a national, <laughs> I was like, yeah, just w watch this space. Um, like Braden said, there's Aboriginal queer scholarship is thriving in Australia. It's fantastic to see. Um, and you can follow uh, uh, all of us, I suppose, for some for national findings that will be coming out soon. Thanks, Beth and Braden, so much. And to Damien for joining us today. Uh, if you'd like to access any of the supporting uh, resources, they're in the info tab down the bottom right hand side. Uh, thanks for everyone who joined us today. We really appreciate your feedback on today's webinar. And you can do that by either scanning the QR code on the slide or hovering at the top of the player that you're looking at this through until the survey banner appears, and that will take you through to the survey link. And all of this information will appear in a slide as well uh, at the, the close of the webinar, which I think should probably be up now, please. Um, we will also be following up with you uh, in the weeks to come with information about the link for how you can watch the recording of this webinar if you missed it or you want to watch it again, and also the, the slides from today and more information about upcoming events. Uh, there's going to be a new Black, webin uh, Black Rainbow uh, Queer Robbery webinar in early 2023, so the third one, uh, which we'd love for you to join us with, and there'll be more information about that coming soon. And then in terms of upcoming uh, webinars, we've got is never too late to diagnose ADHD coming up in a few days time. And we've got non-medical pharmacological supports and programs for older Australians coming up in December. And before that, we've got social and emotional wellbeing um, of children with higher weight coming up in mid-November. So just to wrap up, I'd like to uh, let you know that we'd like to, the MHPM would like to acknowledge lived experiences of people and carers who have lived with mental health in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone participating in the webinar today.